Um, good afternoon and welcome to this, the IIEA's first public event since the coronavirus took hold and changed so much. Our team has been working incredibly hard, as yours has no doubt, to adapt so that we can bring you, uh, our members, the best analysis and insights possible into the pandemic and its many consequences. But this event has more attendees than any we have run in our three decade history it is testament to the scale of the change to our world and the challenges that now exist and indeed the appetite for insights and analysis on, on what's going on. We thought for this first public event that it would be appropriate to bring together a group of people who know all about managing crises, to share their experiences past difficult times and to share their insights into how the current global crisis, perhaps even global emergency, can be addressed. Uh, we'd like to thank them very much for taking the time to join us uh, for this event. Each of our speakers will speak for seven or eight minutes, and then we'll open it up to uh, questions. Uh, this, the questions will be uh, on the record in this instance. Before introducing them, some housekeeping, uh, on that Q&A, audience members will be able to participate using the Q&A function here on Zoom. Uh, you'll see it on the screen. Please don't use the chat function. I'll only be looking at the uh, Q&A function for questions. So please use that if you have a question and identify yourself in your organization as we would normally do if we were meeting in the Apple Institute. Uh, we'll aim to get as many questions as possible in the time that we have available. We'll also be live tweeting the event, so feel free to join that discussion there using the handle at IIEA. Um, so again, this is a new experience for us, so please bear with us if there are any technical challenges. So we'll be going in order, in alphabetical order. So let me uh, introduce the speakers in reverse alphabetical order so that we come to the first speaker um, last, so to speak. So, Mary O'Dee has been Chief Executive of the Institute of Banking since April 2018. Prior to that, she was Director of Securities and Market Supervisions at the Central Bank of Ireland. She was previously Ireland's representative of the World Bank, and prior to that, held the role of the Alternative Executive Director representing Ireland at the IMF from 2011 to 2014. She has also served as Acting Director of Ireland's Financial Regulator in, 1920, in 2009, and prior to that, held a series of senior positions at the Central Bank. Mary is going to speak about the impact of the pandemic on the bank, banking and financial systems. Uh, John Moran, uh, our second uh, speaker, he served as Secretary General of the Department of Finance from 2011 to 2014, helping guide Ireland's post-crisis economic recovery. He previously served as Head of Wholesale Bank Supervision of the Central Bank of Ireland from 2010 to 2011. Before entering public service, he served as CEO of Zurich Bank from 1997 to 2005, he was recently appointed chair of Ireland's Land Development Agency. John's going to speak about the role of finance ministries in the current crisis. Patrick Honan was governor of the Central Bank of Ireland and a member of the Government Council of the ECB from 2009 to 2015. He's an honorary professor of economics at Trinity College Dublin and a non-resident senior fellow at Peterson Institute for International Economics. His most recent book, Currency, Credit and Crisis, provides an account of the financial crisis in Ireland. He's going to speak about the role of policymakers and central bankers in particular. AJ Chopra worked at the International, Inter International Monetary Fund from 1984 to 2014. His final position at the IMF was Deputy, Deputy Director of its European Department, where he was, among other things, responsible for the design and implementation of Ireland's Monetary Rescue Program 2010 to 2013. He's currently an independent consultant based in Washington, D.C and he served as a visiting fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics from 2014 to 2016. And he is going to speak about the international challenges and global policy responses. So, AJ, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Dan. Uh, it's good to be uh, back talking to people in Ireland and I presume elsewhere as well. Uh, I am going to be talking about the importance of international cooperation to deal with this crisis. And I'll be highlighting the role of the G20 and the IMF. Uh, but before talking about uh, international cooperation, I, I need to sort of set the stage as to why international cooperation is, is essential. 
Uh, this is first and foremost a public health crisis and a human crisis. And of course, it's also an economic crisis. And it's going to be impossible to protect the economy unless public health is also protected. So tackling the public health crisis is therefore paramount. And this combination of public health and economic crises makes this radically different from the crises that we've faced in the past. It's hit much harder, it's hit much faster than anything before. And it's certainly very different and much deeper than the 2008, 2010 crisis. So this time it really is different, uh, contrary to the classic book by Carmen Reinhart and Ken Rogoff. Uh, and by that I mean this is not a crisis that is caused by financial folly. Uh, rather, the best metaphor that I've come across to describe the situation is that dealing with the public health crisis uh, requires a large swath of the global economy to be put into an induced coma while maintaining uh, vital organs. So it's this induced coma that is causing supply disruptions and job losses. And the cause, again, is not financial folly as it was in the past. And we're still at the early stage of this, this, this disruption and the situation's likely to get quite a bit worse. At some point uh, when the immediate peril is passed, uh, the economy will need to be reawakened from this coma. And how that reawakening process will, will go is very, very difficult to answer. Uh, so with that as the backdrop, I'm going to focus on the international dimension of the public health and, uh, and, and economic crisis. Uh, why the international dimension? Well, because microbes don't recognize national borders and the health consequences uh, will affect the entire globe. Uh, much of the developing world can't afford to quarantine. Informal labor is the backbone of many of these economies and they don't have access to unemployment uh, insurance and are being pushed into desperation. Uh, but furthermore, uh, uh, from the economic side, uh, these economies are facing a sudden stop or a huge terms of trade shock uh, as commodity prices fall because of the decline in economic activity. Uh, and tour many of these countries are also reliant on tourism, which has collapsed. According to the uh, Inter Institute for, of International Finance, uh, foreign investors have withdrawn about 95 billion from emerging market stocks and bond markets uh, since they woke up to the crisis uh, in the second half of January. And this is four times the outflow in the same period after the start of the 2008 uh, global financial crisis. So there's a risk of disorderly defaults in emerging markets. So international cooperation is paramount. Uh, sadly, the international response so far has been weak. Rich countries have become more inward looking as they fight the pandemic themselves. There's been a lack of leadership, especially uh, from the US. Uh, recently, the G7 couldn't agree on issuing a communique because one country insisted on in calling uh, the coronavirus the Wuhan virus. Uh, the G20 came out with an anodyne statement on March 26 that was long on intention but short on actions. So given this, I'm going to focus on three things. Well, what, should, what should the G20 and more generally the international community uh, be doing? Uh, second, I'll talk about the importance of augmenting IM, the IMF's resources. And third, I just want to highlight something that the Fed has done recently uh, to provide dollar liquidity to emerging market uh, economies. And, and here I apologize in advance if I'm treading on Patrick's uh, 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 bailiwick. Uh, okay, on the G20 and the international community. Uh, you know, I, I told Dan that I wanted to talk about this uh, and then coincidentally, just a couple of days ago, Maurice Obstfeld, uh, uh, who is a non-resident uh, professor at Berkeley and now a non-resident fellow at the Peterson Institute, put out a terrific blog on what the G20 should do. And I would very much commend you to read that. But uh, the key points for the G20 are, you know, the WHO coordinates the international fight against this pandemic. And the WHO's budget is just about five billion for the coming year. So the G20 should call for an immediate increase in the contributions by member governments 
and lead by example by committing uh, specific sums. Another thing that the G20 could do is uh, it, should, it should call for an end to trade barriers. Export restrictions on medical equipment by some countries is, is going to be counterproductive. And the US perversely still maintains tariff and non-tariff barriers for imports of critical products to fight the pandemic. So this is not the time for trade wars. Uh, it's also in the interest of the uh, uh, richer countries to channel resources to help the poor countries. Uh, the IMF and the World Bank have called for a suspension uh, of, debt, uh, of the poorest countries' debt repayments to official creditors and the G20 should endorse this. Now forbearance on official loans will need to be matched by some sort of a mechanism for a standstill on private debt repayments to freeze the situation until the longer term effects of the crisis can be better assessed. I think of this as, as the international equivalent of a temporary moratorium on mortgage for foreclosures. Now the second point on augmenting IMF resources. Uh, the demand for the IMF for IMF financing has skyrocketed. Uh, the IMF managing director last week said, and I quote, never in the 75 years history of our institution have so many countries found themselves in need for emergen emergency financing. 85 countries have approached us so far all at one time. The IMF has estimated that the financing need for developing countries and emerging markets is going to be about two and a half trillion dollars. The IMF has a lending capacity of about 800 billion and its continued availability is uncertain because members must re renew certain lending arrangements by the end of this year. So it's going to be important for rich countries to, to uh, increase their bilateral lending arrangements to the IMF and there should also be consideration of a one-time uh, allocation of special drawing rights, say half a, bill, uh, uh, you know, half a trillion, uh, and then off that emerging and uh, developing countries would receive a sizable sum. The last point I want to talk about is uh, dollar liquidity in emerging markets. Uh, the US dollar is the world's unchallenged reserve currency. Banks all over the world rely on dollar funding for their operations. And this makes the US Fed the world's de facto central bank. Fortunately, with this crisis, the Fed seems to be getting increasingly comfortable with this global role. On March 19th, the Fed reactivated the temporary swap lines uh, that it had established with nine other central banks during the last global financial crisis. And these nine central banks include Brazil, Korea, Mexico, and Singapore. So a very small group of, of, sort of emerging market economies there. But then on March 31, the Fed went further. It launched a repo facility for foreign central banks. So what this repo facility does, it lets central banks that have a large stock of treasuries use those treasuries to get cash from the Fed and thus better serve as a dollar lender of last resort in, in their jurisdictions. Uh, let me wrap up and, and, and I want to say that the reason I highlighted uh, this new Fed repo facility is that it's a great example uh, of innovation with an international reach. We're gonna need a whole lot more innovation like this to deal with this crisis. International cooperation is, is going to be critical the leadership of the IMF, the World Bank, the WHO, they can make exhortations and appeals, but it's the membership that has to be willing and generous with its resources. And to end on a bit of a down note, sadly, there's a void when it comes to global leadership from those countries that do have the resources to help. Thank you. Many thanks for that. Um, sobering, I think, international picture. You mentioned, and just a quick follow-up, you mentioned um, the, uh, you finished on a gloomier note. Could I just ask a, a question that may be slightly more positive? Do the poorest countries in the world, the least developed countries, they tend to be more rural, more agrarian, often less open. Could that offer them some insulation against the impact, at least on the economic side, to deal with the, the health side and, and let 
that maybe the, the, the pandemic, the, the disease spread more slowly, given they're more more rural. I, 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 look, I, uh, on 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 the spread of virus virus, uh, I, I'm, I have no no particular insights about you know how how that might might go, uh, but you know the poorest countries do tend to be commodity exporters, and I think uh, you know the economies are bound to be hit by a global slowdown. Uh, so if it's not the health side, if they're protected on the health side, they're going to be hurt on the economic side. So I think it all sort of comes together. And, and, and you know, the thing is, they, 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 have, they have very weak uh, health systems. I mean, we saw what happened with the Ebola crisis in Africa. Uh, uh, and, 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 and I think there was good international cooperation to deal with, uh, with Ebola uh, uh, and, and new facilities were set up. And that's a good example of what might be done in the current situation, but at, obviously at a much larger scale. Many thanks. Look forward to uh, further questions. Uh, Patrick, uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, picking up from, from what uh, Jay has been talking about, which is the, the broad international situation, I, I want to ask whether in this crisis, which is uh, like the last one, there's a macro financial development dimension, but there's also the public health dimension, which is new. But can we learn something? Can policymakers learn something from uh, patterns that have emerged in policy making in the past crisis. Um, maybe have a look at the, the slides, um, if you could put, put the first one up there. So um, like in the next one then, uh, as Jay said, everybody says this time is different uh, and it is different, but not in a good way. Uh, and that's usually the problem. But I think we can learn uh, something about patterns of response. We have a global system, and I don't call it an economic system, a global system which is optimized and has been developed and refined, but for a narrow range of risks. And we're not, we're not really prepared for large disturbances. We weren't prepared the last time, and we were not prepared this time. That's not to say that people weren't aware that there could be the risk of a global pandemic. It was in the government's risk assessment reports in Ireland every year. Uh, so in, in general terms, we knew and we know that this is a risk, but being prepared for it is a different matter. I would mention three traps, uh, sort of generic traps, which I think were made, uh, that were fallen into to an extent last time round, and, uh, and I'm not sure we're out of it this time either. The first trap is a tendency, and it's this, there may be some psychology behind this, a tendency for policymakers to underestimate the scope of the, the problem as it begins to emerge and its likely scale. So I think both this time and last time, there was a, 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 it was, we were very slow to see a crystallization of the, uh, of the, the problem. We had in the, the last time, we had a kind of phony war uh, situation from the middle of 2007 until the autumn of 2008, where generally uh, policymakers thought that the disturbances in financial markets were confined to an, a narrow segment of the US mortgage market with some spillovers. And then they realized then uh, over a year after this problem had, had uh, started that it was going to metastasize right out into the, into the system as a whole. The second trap um, so, so the result of that is that the application of tools, that you've got tools, but they're too slow and at first too un unambitious in using those tools. A second trap, I think, is a vagueness on the end game. Where, where are we going to go? Things have changed. We didn't understand exactly where we were and now we need to get somewhere else. Where is that end game? And do we know what the best uh, plan, the best uh, goal is? And if we can't reach that goal, do we have fallback positions which are not quite as good, but that we can achieve? And that was very important for us in Ireland uh, in relation to debt sustainability, where we went for some time saying maybe we can manage this without um, being shut out of the markets. But when we were shut out of the markets, we were very ready to fall back on, on the IMF and we were 
very ready to fall back if necessary on other you know debt restructuring possibilities where there in the background we were ready to do that if it was needed if it was not needed and it was healthier for the economy to stay uh, to stay away from those um, the third point and this touches a little bit on on what uh, jay was saying there we're in an internationally interdependent world and these interdependencies are not fully exploited by policymakers. We're not geared up for it. It's, it's a political dimension, there's an economic dimension, there's a financial dimension to these interdependencies, and now there's a healthcare dimension. And, and all of these are, are uh, potential hazards and potential opportunities that are sometimes not exploited. I'm an economist. Economic, uh, economists deal with trade-offs, and trade-offs are important in dealing with an unexpected situation, a crisis like this. Let me move to the next slide and just give a few hints. So the, the big, I suppose, the big, if we ask for what, what was the big uh, trade-off last time in Ireland, for example, the big trade-off was to try to maintain or recover investor confidence, which was going to be essential to have a medium-term uh, economic recovery, trade that off against the need for fiscal expansion to pay for unemployment, to maintain public services. So you had a, a pressure on public services, on public sector wages, unemployment going up, but more fiscal expansion would lose investor confidence even more. So that was a very difficult trade-off which had to be managed the way through. The big trade-off now, if we look for one big trade-off that's economically relevant, is the, uh, the trade-off, if you like, between the public health issues and virus containment versus the economic shutdown, which also, of course, spill back into public in other ways. Now, I, I, I should say right away, you can make this calculation. It's quite clear from all the calculations that I've seen, even though, as I will say in a minute, we're very, very uncertain about all the parameters, it's quite clear that the choice to shut down is a correct choice on any kind of cost benefit calculation using a, a, a conventional approaches to that. Let me unpack this a little more. Let's look at the next slide and give a few examples because we have to not only decide which side of the trade-off we, we are favoring, but what tools to use, how much, uh, how much we should exploit those tools, what types of tools and when should they be used. So for example, for the last time, uh, in the European context, well, ECB policy, um, uh, there's a risk that I would spend a lot of time talking about that. I will not talk, spend a lot of time talking about that, but it's clear that, the, that there were mistakes made in, in deciding what particular policy tools. Um, there was no quantitative easing for five, six years. Uh, interest rates were, wholesale interest rates were brought down. Uh, but uh, insufficient attention to the fact that the uh, financial market in Europe was fragmenting. So there were a lot of, of uh, policy choices that were being made uh, too late and without sufficient understanding of the economic structures and the way the economy was reacting to the policy or not reacting to the policy and the financial system. Outside the ECB's sphere, the fiscal stance also. That was a decision. The decision was made initially uh, by the larger countries to allow a, a great fiscal expansion, but it was reined in too quickly. In Ireland, we had uh, we, we had a slightly different issue. But again, with the scale of the, of the fiscal cutbacks, um, I think we we the, the decisions made about that needed a good understanding of the economic responses and what the costs of various fiscal measures were going to be in terms of the economy. Uh, and I think by and large, we were lucky or managed to, to maneuver that in a way that probably we did it more or less as well in the economic recovery as we could, given what was on offer. The handling of the bank recapitalization was also raised a lot of difficult questions. You could recapitalize the banks to a very, very safe position, but only at the cost of putting the, the public finances in a perilous situation. So there was a need to understand the economic interactions and the financial. I'm only saying that to, to lead to this question now. Now we have questions about 
for example, the shutdowns and the question of reopening and how would that reopening happen? What sectors should one promote uh, to be the first ones to reopen or in addition from the, the collection that are at present closed? What categories of person could be released from, from the, the, the constraints? What places, schools, so on? In order to decide on those things, to, to make those choices, um, we need to understand things that haven't been studied very much. Supply chains, um, input output tables, people dredging up from the past that haven't been used for years. But we need also to be very well, much aware of side effects, uh, side effects on, on, um, on inequality. Um, we need to, the, the, the measures that are being adopted, uh, for example, to compensate for the shutdown in terms of providing income support and uh, to persons, uh, finance to firms. As Jay said, this is happening also on the global scale. Uh, the ECB have expanded lending, the Federal Reserve have expanded. What, they, what the central banks are doing though, is they are stabilizing wholesale, wholesale interest rates and wholesale markets with their huge asset purchases. That, that doesn't solve it doesn't resolve solvency problems. Congress has, and, and fiscal authorities are trying to deal with solvency problems. So there are, um, um, there's a question of understanding an econ economy which has shut down in a way that's not previously, has never previously been done. So trying to understand that and modeling it and getting it right. There are comparable issues in the medical side of things because there's modeling in the medical dimension as well, to, the need for, more tests, better tests uh, about infectiousness and about antibodies. So it, here again, there's a, a need for, um, for uh, understanding, detailed understanding of the process, which is an unfamiliar process. Perhaps I'd mention as well in, on the, in the old time, for example, uh, to uh, give you another example of understanding the economy, um, the macroprudential tools that, that were introduced to um, stabilize the recovering housing finance market. Um, this required a lot of analysis of a type that hadn't been done before in understanding the financial system in Ireland and the, and the uh, impact on, on the housing market and, the, and on, on prices. Uh, that's constantly under review. I'm sure it'll be reviewed again, it'll need to be tweaked, um, and then we need to understand the economy to get those kinds of policies right. Um, let me uh, move because I'm running away away from time to uh, oh yes let me show you these slides though um, just when I was talking about understanding the process I, I, I think it's very interesting to track uh, what data we have in in the public sphere and um, I just like these charts I thought I would show them to um, our, our, our friends at the IIEA and um, this is the way to show I think the trends in this. First of all, they should be on, on a log scale, so that a straight line means uh, constant proportional growth. Then they should be shown as a percentage of the population of countries, which most people don't do. It's a very easy thing to do, because otherwise you're, the curves are all over the place and you don't realize that they're all over the place simply because one country is bigger than another. And then you have to start them at the right place. I've started these charts at the, uh, on the day that the number of cases reached one per million of the population and that green line is Ireland and you can see it's lying exactly on the German line it's three days behind the German line it's uh, 12 or 13 days behind the Ita behind Italy and a little bit lower it's uh, four or five days behind Spain a good deal lower it's actually higher in terms of measured cases if you believe it than UK about the same level next slide shows you deaths and um, uh, can we see the next slide and anyway, it's a similar. Can we see the next slide, please? Yeah, and we see a, a similar uh, slide here. Here, Ireland's um, uh, trend, a little bit above those other countries, except for Spain, but curving down rather rather uh, encouragingly. Um, and in this case, about 25 days behind Italy. And I'm only saying that to remind you that analysis needs to be done. It's a lot more analysis is being done uh, on, on much more refined models of, of the epidemic but we know extraordinarily little about those relevant parameters. Final point, and I think I've run out of time, so I don't think I'll say very much about it, is the question of communication and cooperation. Cooperation with international partners. Partly that's a question of finding the common ground, 
partly it's a question of using the collective strength. We're not using the collective strength in Europe yet. There are some, some encouraging signs that as a political move towards using the financial muscle of Europe as a whole to address the complex problems, of financial problems and macroeconomic problems which are emerging as this uh, crisis matures. Um, and the final point about communication. Uh, communication, we all favor transparency, but it's never absolute. It's never fully transparent. For example, when we were uh, moving towards the uh, intervention and the liquidation of the old Anglo IBRC bank, we couldn't, we couldn't say, oh, by the way, we might liquidate this bank in a week's time or in three days time or in one day's time. So there are, there are limits to transparency. And I think we're also seeing that, that at present, and it's a delicate issue for governments to decide exactly how much they are communicating on what they're planning to do in, in, uh, in addressing th this crisis on the medical side and the, the uh, economic shutdown side as it evolves. And it's a very, very difficult and complex question. People must, uh, the communication must engender sufficient trust in the population that the population knows well we won't be told everything but we'll be told the things that are safe for us to be told it's a difficult choice thank okay. you well, thank you patrick very frank uh many thanks for that john we'll go over to you without any further ado thank you you're still muted john you need to unmute Okay, great. All right. Um, I've tried to send us a couple of slides up there, which hopefully everyone has. Um, and first of all, thank you, Dan, for, for the invitation and for pulling everybody together. I think in some respects, this is all going to fit for pretty much with what has been said before. So, so I'll try not to, to go through all ground again. Um, but in order to sort of help think about this, I, I decided to try and come up with kind of 10 individual pointers that I might be thinking about in terms of how we go at this in terms of the recovery. <clears throat> so it's not to say that these are the only ones, but they at least should help people to, to think about, about some of the issues that have been raised. Um, and I suppose the first and really important point is, is in many ways, a lot of people have been assuming, oh my God, here we go again, uh, another big crisis that we're getting into, and it'll be the same. It, as Patrick and in particular said, this is not the same as the last time around. But the important thing about it, which is what I have on these two slides, really is to point out that because it's not the same, and it's obviously a very different genesis of a crisis than a health crisis, but more importantly, we start in a very different place. So we start with a much lower cost of borrowing, and indeed we started going into the situation with an employment number that was actually higher than last time round. Um, and we are not, look, we look at a very general, generous, so to speak, um, but slow recovery of unemployment the last time, whereas this time, of course, the, the, the drop has been cataclysmic, and therefore it requires a number of different tools. But the important thing to remember is this first point, um, which feeding through means that unlike the last time where we were effectively shut out of the markets, this time we can borrow um, in order to get ourselves out of this. And I think that is, is as has been said, with an economy in, in sort of, you know, put into a coma, as AJ has said, this is a really important tool for us to kind of keep that economy alive during the, the period of hiatus, and more importantly, to work out how to get out of it. Um, somebody asked me in the last couple of days about this question of, well, if we add more, how are we going to not end up with the debt sustainability issues that we had the last time? And again, it comes back to this really key um, relationship between what the average interest rate might be and the, and the growth rate. In the past, the problem was is that our interest rate was much higher than the growth rate, where around our nominal growth rate should be in excess of the rates. And that's where the ECB's response is so important. It is absolutely critical. Only the ECB has the firepower to deal with this across the entire European Union. It needs to continue to continue with its, its, its basically policy decision to allow governments to borrow at, at 
low rates of interest that are essentially below the, the rate of growth that they might expect to, to have once they, they get through the crisis. And so that's a, a really important thing. That is what will allow us to, to not have the same sort of, you know, problems about austerity that we had the last time. And I think this is a really important message for the government to get to fairly quickly, um, because insofar as economies are all about confidence, we run the risk of rupturing the economy very seriously if people are afraid of what's coming down the track. So I think going back to Patrick's point about actually doing stuff fairly quickly and in scale, I think that, that's really important, not just because that's what should be done, but it's really important to get the right level of confidence back in the economy about the future. Um, another really important point is ensuring solidarity. We're all very kind of familiar that at the moment, a lot of what we're doing is not just to save the economy, it's for the very important sort of, you know, social purpose of protecting vulnerable people in our community. But we have to sort of, you know, work our way through the choices, and I'll come back to that later, in a way that makes sure that we don't build in inequality um, of recovery in the, in the way that may have happened sort of, you know, the last time where people who owned houses saw large recovery um, in their things, but because we weren't able to deal with the supply of housing, etc., other people suffered. We know very well that lots of the more vulnerable people in our community over 65 at the moment are still on pensions, whereas the younger people are probably the ones suffering the majority of job losses. So how we unwind that is, is really important going forward. But I think it's just as important that we deal with some of the inequa the solidarity issues that both Patrick and AJ have raised, these issues of North and South Europe, rich countries versus poor countries, and most importantly, what do we do with the developing world countries and how do we manage those? Because we can all remember that ultimately our economy is very much an open economy and therefore we need to make sure that we don't just solve our own problems, but that we have solved the problems for other countries. In the last while, a lot of people have talked about this idea of let's throw a lot of cash at this and we'll borrow. I think the important thing to remember is any cash that we borrow is essentially going to have to be repaid by people in the future. So this isn't, in a sense, it might sound like free money. Uh, if the interest rate is zero, it is not free. And they are the trade-offs all the time. We know where we put the trade-offs the last time. Some people acknowledge those in terms of the compromises Patrick mentioned. Other people were unhappy and felt that we should have borrowed more money and had more money to be paid off into the future. But what is really important is recognizing that borrowing money, albeit at the low interest rate, is not free. Um, the important thing is to use it very carefully. And so I think the ideas around that we should just throw cash around to every citizen is not the answer. We have to do things in big scale, and I think we've probably not seen enough scale up to now in terms of the answers that we're doing, and we need that quickly, but it shouldn't be indiscriminately thrown around everywhere. It needs to be very targeted to the type of issues that Patrick as well mentioned about sort of making sure that businesses survive through the crisis and that we can reignite people's confidence when, when we get back to it. Um, the next point I wanted to, to raise is this issue that not all heroes wear capes. I think we will see an inevitable reaction going forward about the desire to rebuild, maybe the wrong word, but to enhance our public health system and indeed reward all, reward all the people that have been to the forefront at the moment. We need to remember that in the context of doing that, I think we're going to see a seminal shift towards people wanting protection, maybe localization of the production of a lot of, of that kind of equipment within the European Union, perhaps, um, and a run to nationalization on that. But we also need to be very careful to protect the other elements that may not be as politically um, easy to, to defend, particularly businesses. Mary, I know we'll talk about the banks. Ultimately, providing liquidity supply and income support for households, which was inevitably the first thing to do, means that if you are cutting off their, their bills, you are creating a contagion impact through the system. And I think, again, it's really important that we make a very big distinction between providing just liquidity support for businesses and ultimately dealing with the solvency issues that they are going to face if we actually get into this um, and come out of the crisis. Because I think we will actually find ourselves 
needing to not just borrow and lend to companies, but actually giving them some solvency help over the future, which can, as been done in other countries, be tied to objectives that we want to, to achieve, like employment and keeping people on the, on the, on the payroll. Um, the sixth point I wanted to make uh, is for anybody who might be thinking that this is a bit like Italia 90, where we just shut down our economy for a couple of weeks and we, re, we restarted it once we had gotten over the party. This is not the same situation. I probably am of the group that thinks that we are hitting, heading for a much deeper shock in the short term than perhaps some of the studies that have been done beforehand. There will be a recovery, but it could be as early as 2020. One, I would say, or the end of that, or maybe 2022, before we are back to where we were going into this crisis, and recognize that that means we actually have then had a shock to the system. I don't think the world would be the same either. I think people would be a lot more cautious. I don't think we'll see these kinds of celebrations in the short term, because one of the important learnings from previous pandemics, um, particularly the, the Spanish flu, is that you do not want to have another outbreak on this. So I think we'll have to get back to this very gently. Um, I think one learning from the last crisis was the need for very robust governance. It doesn't have to be my former department, but what's very clear is I would be certainly of the view that we should, as Patrick said, work out where our end game is, what are the alternatives, and have a very clear path to that so everybody from investors and companies from people across the system understand where we're going, and that will require a very robust governance but actually, at the same time, I, I think looking forward to what that might look like, I think we have probably undergone an acceleration of a number of changes in the way we live our lives, and life will not be the same again. And I think if we can embrace those and think about those in a positive way, we may come up with a very different um, Ireland to rebuild in that process. I think our relationship in terms of spatial questions will change, where we live, how we live, it's not just a question of big density, it's a question of the structure of our, of our homes and our housing. Um, I think the use of tech and homeworking will change the way in which we've looked at things in the past and perhaps allow us to get into some of these darnier questions about regional balanced development that we've struggled with. Um, and I guess we have to remember that we have had a lot of pre-crisis issues that are still there, particularly in the housing area, and we need to think about that. Uh, what that means is that our priorities have probably changed in the last couple of, of weeks um, across a whole range of things. I think we will come out of this with a greater desire to have a greater system of protection of our citizens. Um, I think we will want greater investment in our health. Um, and therefore, the protection against the virus will seem the same as protection against climate change. And I think the political system for which we need a strong government will probably conclude that we need a bit more government than we've in the past, and our priorities have changed in terms of how we think about that. Okay. I'm on the other hand, it up in a positive way, uh, which is I think that if we embrace an awful lot of that, uh, if we do this well, we can actually recreate a future to look forward to. I think we have gone into this with a large deficit in housing, infrastructure, We've reinvented the meaning of community in our country and valuing the simple things. And I think if we carefully use this money that we need to protect companies and stimulate the economy so that it goes into capital investment rather than just simply into recurring current expenditure, then I think we can, in the words of the of the Fisic and the Irish Examiner, we can prevail again. And so I remain optimistic, but there will be a rough couple of years to, to ride our way through this. Thanks again. Okay, uh, thank you, John. Before giving the floor to Mary, can I just say we've got a lot of questions coming in. If you're to have any chance of getting your question to the panelists, I'd urge you to get them in now. We'll probably go on to 2.15 a little longer than we would as people want to, to commute in and out of the Institute. I, you may have more time to, uh, to devote to the Q&A session. So as I say, we'll go on to 12.15 with the Q&A, but do get your questions in as we have a great many questions already in. Uh, Mary, over to you. Thanks very much, Dan. Um, just before I say anything, I want to emphasize that I think I say here today, of course, are my personal views, not those of the Institute or indeed of UCD, but the Institute is a recognized college of. Um, I, I also want to pause, especially having seen um, Patrick's graphs there, 
to say that we know that this crisis has so badly affected lives right across the world already. Uh, those who have already died and those who are working hard on the front line. And it's just important, I think, to, to contextualise that as we're having the discussion today. So when Diana asked me to talk about the financial sector, uh, I was thinking about the broadness of it. And I decided in the interests of time to focus very much on the banking side. Uh, I'll give a fleeting reference to some other areas. But also I want to focus on where I think lessons can be learned from the previous crisis. So yes, I agree with everybody who has said this time it really is different. And it's especially different, I think, for banks heading into this crisis. Uh, the source of the crisis, of course, is a very different one. As Jay has said, we're talking about a, a public health crisis, not uh, something that is a banking crisis. And the strength of the capital and liquidity position of the banks, the overall financial strength heading into it, is so much better than last time round, learning from the lessons of the past but also the composition of that financial strength is greatly enhanced. There's been a rigorous uh, assessment of the balance sheet strength of our banks, both here and globally. And the data even that is available in order to assess the level of capital is vastly uh, superior to what was there pre-crisis. Uh, also, it's, it's tested by the SSM and others apart from domestic, domestic regulator. And banks have now already been able to um, release their countercyclical buffers, uh, which exactly doing what it says on the tin, being there for the times when the cycle changes. Within banks, I think as well, the organisational structure is much more resilient. Um, in June 2009, you have to remember, we had three banks who were seeking CEOs, two banks who were seeking chairs, and two who were without risk officers. So the level of governance as we worked through the crisis was very, very different. And of course, there was no expertise in managing uh, delinquent loans or in working through any level of forbearance. And banks were very much caught up in scrambling to value assets as we moved uh, towards what ultimately was an AMA solution. So I think the capital resilience right across the banking sector, and this is true in other sectors because other regulators have learned uh, from looking at the banking side, securities regulators have followed suit, uh, investment funds, uh, there's been greater emphasis on things like circuit breakers, redemption gates. So all of those things are in place to prepare us better for this crisis. Uh, and indeed in insurance companies, there's also been an increase uh, in the solvency requirements there. But I do think there that regulators and particularly from a financial stability perspective must be looking very closely at the insurance sector and the reinsurance sector globally um, because it's no doubt that there will be payouts way beyond stress tests that may have already been completed. And regulators are quite rightly now saying to insurance companies uh, please look and give the benefit of the doubt as you deal with, insure, with uh, both businesses and individuals in claims. And I think this will actually be a real test of culture within the insurance world uh, as we work our way through this. So then what are the lessons from the last time round? Well, one of them, I think, has been mentioned by a couple of others already, which is that speed really does matter. Now, last time, banks were actually the problem that we were trying to fix whereas now banks have a crucial role to pay, play in being part of the solution. Forbearance now is a good thing. Um, if we use the induced uh, coma solution, we have to make sure that the patient stays alive uh, all the way through. The nature of banks, of course, gives them a very special place uh, in the recovery. And they need uh, to adjust very quickly to this new role. They have been carrying on um, post-crisis in a business as usual way, uh, and now they're uh, immediately thrown, as, as Jay said, harder, sharper, faster and deeper into a completely different world that again requires a very different uh, operating model. And it requires them to draw on the full ecosystem of regulators and policymakers to support them as they work their way through this and find impediments to what they're doing in terms of keeping the, the patient alive. It needs to be a whole system approach for this. So I would suggest that a forum needs to be set up to remove any blockers there are to keeping these businesses alive. 
and to include all the relevant actors in that, trashing out the issues uh, that may need others to be involved, so those that may, we may need to draw on the EU, etc., and working up those plans very quickly. Uh, I think there will be a future reward for those banks that really are there for their customers at this time and in this time of need. And of course, the other reward will be that the economy uh, will recover quickly uh, if they work through this correctly. The second lesson I draw on, and somebody has mentioned the topic, uh, John has mentioned the topic of governance at a sort of the national level. I would also mention governance uh, and strategy at a uh, banking sector and financial sector level. I think last time round there was insufficient attention to uh, the strategic matters that banks would have to deal with. So for example, their, their early plans and their profitabilities, they weren't sufficiently credible for operating in that new environment quickly enough. It's very understandable that the immediate attention is of course on firefighting, it's on business continuity, call centres are now flooded with calls and banks are adapting to that risk and actually doing it very well this time round. However, I think uh, that the boards have a special role to play now uh, in examining whether or not the strategy that they're currently following needs to be re-engineered in some way for the future. So last time round again, remember that people were looking at strategies without the benefit in the early days at least of having the whatever it takes backstop or without having the NAMA solution in place but similarly now, the role of the board is, while providing direction and support in terms of the short-term measures, it must be critically looking at strategy, at operating models, what needs to be adjusted. And while we're all hoping for that shorter-term fix, they must be preparing for longer-term implications, at least until a vaccine is found. So in short, I suppose it's a time for leaders at both chair level and at CEO levels to strongly lead and to lead out with their values and culture clearly on display as they do so. I think they also need to bear in mind the changes in customer behaviour. So last time round, remember, it was very hard to get people to start spending again, uh, despite a period of, long, of low interest rates. Uh, the impact on sentiment this time could be similar. Uh, remember, people in their lifetimes will have had two very severe, significant economic uh, shocks. Uh, I also think there'll be an additional sort of mood of the nation, which will be exacerbated because it'll be a mood of the world with the fallout that, that comes from this in terms of personal tragedy. Uh, others have mentioned other things that will change. So, for example, huge acceleration in digital, we're seeing that already and um, financial sector can take uh, advantage of this and use this as an opportunity for the future. And of course, uh, an acceleration, I would imagine, in the trend towards sustainable finance as that other existential threat now becomes very sharply focused as we see uh, this one moving along. Third area then where I would draw um, lessons from the past is around uncertainty, emerging data, which Patrick touched on a little bit, and big ideas, which I think you, you also mentioned, Patrick. So if you remember the last time as we worked on solutions, the outcomes at the time would have been utterly unthinkable. There would have been issues that, we, we, that wouldn't have entered people's minds. We watched Lehman Brothers collapse. We saw the scale of, of losses in the banking system uh, rising. We had this prolonged period of ELA that people would have said could never have happened. And we ended up being the third biggest borrower in the IMF. So all of those things were unthinkable at the time. And whatever solutions we work towards now and as events unfold are things that we have to know are probably unthinkable right now. The financial markets, of course, we know don't like uh, certainty. Um, but financial market players need to come together to be part of the solution now and to use their brightest and their best to, to feed in those proposals. Last time around, we had a significant lack of data. Um, and for example, when we started tracking um, liquidity, we got a much richer sense of what the data was by talking directly to the Treasury departments and understanding what the picture looked like. So there's the numbers, but there's also the story around what is it telling us. And this time around, I would suggest that we need uh, to consult with the financial sector, the, that is the public sector consult with the financial sector early and often to set up reporting systems specifically around impact on sectors what are good solutions? What are working? Because there will be different solutions 
for different sectors. Uh, what supports are needed, what's missing, and keep all of this information together in one place so that all decision makers can access it in terms of working towards solutions. Finally, then the lesson that I would the final lesson that I would draw on is avoiding groupthink. So we spoke quite a bit about how groupthink in the lead up to the crisis last time round and things like people uh, buying into soft landing. Uh, but we haven't said too much about groupthink during the crisis. For me, it's absolutely crucial during a crisis to allow for the role of a contrarian. And that is preferably somebody who actually has a contrarian view rather than somebody who's playing devil's advocate. It's really important for us to consider what might be termed outlandish uh, ideas and to make sure that we have very inclusive decision making. Most effective cultures have really uh, effective uh, inclusion in decision making and including those different points of view, not being all sucked into a groupthink attitude, I think is really important. And then uh, finally, I think I would say that all crises hurt people. And we have to remember that people are still hurting from the last crisis. People will hurt and are hurting very significantly from this crisis. And I mentioned values in the context of the financial sector and culture. And I think as a nation, it's important to remember our own values and our own culture. So our values are very much people focused. And we have, as John suggested, uh, rediscovered, I think, a strong community focused culture. And I think tapping into those as we guide, as we use them as guiding lights for our decisions will be very important throughout this particular crisis. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Mary. Some uh, really nice uh, po points there to, to round up. Uh, we've got a load of questions. I'm going to pick out four, one each for you. So, Dermot O'Leary at Good Body. Uh, this is to you, Jay. Do you think IMF members, the wealthier ones, are actually going to pay up at this time? Uh, Fergal McNamara, one for you, Mary. Fergal McNamara, GCB, asks about deglobalization. He wonders, is this going to bring about deglobalization? So maybe, Mary, if you had any thoughts on that in general, and in particular from, from, the, uh, from the sector you know best, do you think this will lead to a pullback in a deglobalization process? Uh, for you, Patrick, uh, Sarah Carey, columnist, uh, asks about disaster economics. Is that is, is the literature on disaster economics where we need to be looking now? And John, um, Declan uh, Harmon asks about universal basic income. Is it an idea whose time has come? So maybe we'll start off with you, Jay, on whether IMF members will pay up. Thank you, Dan. Uh, look, uh, the short answer is I don't know, but I can tell you what uh, what uh, is being sought. Uh, as I said, uh, you know, uh, a part of the IMF's funding comes from bilateral lending arrangements, and if these lending arrangements uh, do require renewals, uh, uh, and if they uh, were not renewed by the end of this year, they will decline by about two hundred billion dollars, a little bit less than that. So a first step would be to renew those, uh, the, those bilateral lending arrangements uh, and increase them. And I think, I think you know, uh, uh, there's, there's some positive signs on that, uh, including on uh, the US share of the new arrangements to borrow, which was included in the, uh, in the legislation that was passed on, uh, on March 27th in the US. Uh, but the other important aspect over here, uh, as I said, and, and as the IMF's managing director has requested, uh, has, has sought, is, is a large one-time allocation of, uh, of special drawing rights. Uh, you know, the, the, the special drawing rights are an asset and a liability of the, uh, of the IMF. Uh, 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 and and uh, I, to be honest, I cannot remember when, when, when the last uh, SDR allocation was done, uh, but this is uh, uh, but this is that this would be a, a, a how to put it uh, you know uh, 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 this this should be feasible I think uh, and and if it was done uh, you know uh, it would it would boost uh, the IMS lending capacity let's say they managed to increase it by uh, half a trillion in in dollar terms. Uh, that that would mean uh, you know uh, just just less than half of that would actually then be available uh, for lending to the poorer countries because these get allocated based on 
on quota shares. Uh, so I think, I, think, I think work is being done. I think uh, 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 this is something that the G20 uh, uh, ought to stand behind. There's a, the, uh, the spring meetings are going to be done in a virtual format this year in, in another week or so. Uh, and so we might have, have more, more news uh, after that. Good. Um, Mary, on the deglobalization piece. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's a very much it depends answer. We had already seen a move towards uh, increased protectionism, I think, in the lead up to the crisis. So that's, that wasn't, that trend was there already. Um, but I think you have to draw a distinction between perhaps uh, political cycles and political trends uh, that may have been heading in that direction. Uh, and how markets are actually working and operating. So I think that the counter to that is the massive acceleration in digitalization. And the world becomes very small then, uh, as we can, for example, have these meetings with people all over the world uh, and, and increase globalization in that way. And I think we're also seeing from a science point of view, uh, the speed at which scientific information is being spread right across the globe uh, as it puts, tr looks for a solution to this particular problem is increasing globalization. So I think there are some very practical trends that are increasing globalization, but crucial will be how the politics will play out. And here, the EU really does have a strong role to play as a leader at this particular moment in time uh, to, to make sure it intervenes uh, in areas where protectionism might be raising its head. Patrick, disaster economics? Yeah, well, I never about disaster economics. I, I think there are things that we, we can learn from big events in the past and, and the current event. Resilience is probably going to be a catch word for the recovery phase and long into the future. That would be resilience. And so that, uh, obviously public health resilience will be a major issue. My guess is that, that the these public health problems, uh, solutions will be found, viable solutions and change, behavior may be changed permanently, but not in a way that we can't, can't cope with. But I think that we'll also be looking and people will, will uh, be more sensitive and aware to other resilience issues, climate change issues, inequality issues. These are all issues of, of social and uh, physical resilience. Uh, so this is a disaster of one, of one sort or another, but, but the solution, the long-term solution to it is to build greater resilience around our systems. And um, with a wartime analogy, maybe not disaster, I mean, the wartime analogy has been made by many people. And let's remember that in World War I, came, people, countries came out of World War I heavily indebted. And these debt problems were not properly resolved in World War I, and we got World War II. And after World War II, the debt issues were resolved. There was the Marshall Plan and there were other, uh, the IMF was created and so on. So the debt issues and, and resolving that quickly, um, that's a lesson from, from the emergence from wartime economics and wartime economics is administrative and control economics, which we have now as well. So a lot of lessons will be people are, are dr drilling into those experiences from, from the earlier. I think this, this uh, experience will change politics in a lot of countries. And I think that if you want to know what's going to happen now, talk to an expert in politics because politics is going to govern what, what um, uh, countries and governments decide, how they decide to steer our societies and our economies out. There are several different routes and they will choose between those routes. Uh, there are also some bad routes. Let's hope politics doesn't uh, collapse in, in, in a way, in a bad way. I don't think it need, need to. Thank you. Uh, John, universal basic income? Yeah, I mean, this is a difficult one, and I don't think I can answer it in two or three minutes here. But I think from echoing what Patrick said, and I said earlier, I think we are going into a, are going to come out of this with a very different perspective on society. And, and one of the things I can't really get my head around is even the assumptions we make about people's desire to work, to, to earn money, et cetera, relative to the desire to spend time with family, perhaps other priorities, I think we may see a fundamental shift in that. And I think, therefore, issues like you know, basic income should be on the table. We should look at them, we should study them, they're complex. And I suppose in some ways we should look at it. What I do think will happen 
is there'll be a much greater call for particularly in other countries where this has been perhaps present in the past for universal basic services. So I think the idea of, of health services, the you know, protection for people against sort of shocks to their own lives, I think will become much more prevalent across across this political dilemma that Patrick just raised in terms of how these decisions are made. Because one of the things that, that I'm surprised I haven't seen a bit more of at the European level, which relates to this, this protection, is back in 2013, 2014, we were looking for the possibility of our European-wide unemployment scheme that would actually provide the automatic stabilizers for countries when they were going into shock. I'm very nervous about where we're going at the moment because we seem to be providing different supports for different people in different countries across Europe, whether it is for businesses, whether it's for individuals. And so rather than a corona bond issuance that just can make up the money, I think I would have a preference for something like a large fund raised at the European level that actually takes over the unemployment obligations of individual countries, but in a harmonized way. So you don't actually have a better result if you happen to be met unemployed in a rich country rather than the first country. And I think equally, the looking at businesses in the same sort of way, I think the, 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 this knee-jerk reaction from the, from the richer countries to protect their pack and their people is understandable, but very dangerous. And we can't let it go back to the kind of north-south and debates that we had before in the last crisis. So, so I think moving towards that is definitely a way I would go. And if that gets into these basic income basic services, I think that's the future for years. Okay, thank you. Look, we've got a lot of questions coming in on health, and perhaps I should have said this at the beginning, but clearly this is not, uh, this session isn't focused on health. We are working really hard to get global health experts to speak, and hopefully we'll get uh, appropriate people in the coming weeks. But as you can understand, they are very difficult uh, to get. They're extremely focused on, on the emergency at the moment. So I'm not going to throw uh, any of the health questions uh, as our as our as our panel, I'm sure would would, would say as as one already has that that's not their area of expertise. Could I'm going to throw a whole bunch of questions at people if I could just ask you 60 seconds because we've we've gone over time and we're we risk going over even the extended deadline. So maybe I know it may be a bit superficial, but if I could just ask you very quickly to give uh, responses. So uh, Jay, your your former um, and maybe don't even you don't even need to answer them all. Your former colleague Donald Donovan from from the fund asked your opinion on Corona bonds, and Robert Short from the National Broadcaster asked uh, how about how would a debt standstill work? Um, Mary, to you, David Kelly, managing partner at Am uh, Amrop, asked about the uh, partial hibernation bankruptcies. Uh, how does that affect uh, companies in the banking system? Uh, three, John, to you, uh, David Chance of uh, the Irish Independent is asking about proposals to let the young go back to work earlier. Um, and Patrick, Michael Tutty, asking about the ECB position on supporting the financial system and sovereigns and helicopter money is also questioned by Ryan Gibbons. So maybe, again, just if I could ask you to keep it really short, I know maybe superficial, um, Jay, those questions on death stands for Corona bonds, if you have any thoughts. Uh, yes, thank, thank you, Dan. Uh, look, uh, firstly, on, on Euro bonds or Corona bonds, this has been on the agenda for at least the last decade, but it hasn't moved forward, I think, uh, you know, if this is this is the time for Europe to show some solidarity and move in this direction of creating a safe asset uh, for uh, you know across the euro area. Uh, again, if not now, when? Uh, I don't think it's an immediate necess necessity to to handle the, the the crisis, but I think it will be very valuable to have for the resilience of the euro area on this i just want to make uh, to commend the ecb on one step that they took uh, fairly recently uh, this is the pep i can't remember exactly what pep stands for uh, uh, but it's 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 there it, it's it's the new mechanism by which uh, they can buy uh, 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 you know uh, government uh, sovereign bonds and 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 also if i'm not mistaken corporate bonds without uh, uh, essentially without restriction, 
And I think you know, this is a major move and I was very happy to see uh, the ECB do it. I would imagine somebody like Philip Lane would have had uh, a big role in its design. So, so that, that, was, that was excellent uh, to see uh, the ECB taking that step. And I think that that certainly helps in, uh, in reducing pressures uh, right now. Uh, and, and sort of obviates the need for some of these other, other steps, uh, at least in the short term. On debt standstills, this, you look, the, the complicated legal issues over here, uh, 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 and, and you know these are not these are not something that I, uh, I'm uh, I'm I'm very uh, you know uh, that's that 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 I'm very familiar with. But I, uh, for whoever asked that question, uh, I would uh, uh, suggest that you look at a uh, uh, a piece that was done by Lee Buchheit and Sean Hagen. Uh, that appeared in FT Alphaville uh, just about a week, uh, 10 days ago. And I think that those two are the experts on this issue, on sovereign, on sovereign debt issues. And they lay out, uh, you know, how the legal impediments uh, to, uh, to putting in place such a standstill might be overcome. Again, it's going to require some impetus from the G20, the IMF, uh, uh, to, to, push, to push this forward. Uh, and as I said, when I, when I first mentioned it, uh, think of this in terms of uh, uh, you know, like having a, a temporary moratorium on mortgage uh, foreclosures. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Mary, can uh, a wave of corporate bankruptcies be avoided? Well, I think all the measures that are being put in place are precisely to do that. I think this is precisely what, what the the measures that are there are to do to do that. Uh, I'm not an expert on how pausing a bankruptcy during hibernation would work. I don't know about that, but I think that's precisely why we would need a forum where these issues get surfaced and really quickly tackled um, by the relevant policymakers. So, for example, if if additional emergency legislation is needed in certain cases, that's where it gets dealt with, or if it can be put under some other. Uh, structure or regulation, that's where it gets dealt with. But I think the whole point is to avoid uh, a raft of uh, corporate bankruptcies. And, and my idea in terms of the data and monitoring the data sector by sector is to see what are the early warning signs in terms of you know, keeping in contact with the employees, the, the, the strategy of the business still being fit for purpose as, as uh, we begin to emerge from the crisis, etc. Uh, and, and building up that strong resilience, I suppose, that Patrick talked about. Thank you. Uh, Patrick, uh, maybe the most controversial uh, of the issues that have been discussed is helicopter money, the idea that people would be issued uh, cash that wouldn't be repaid. Do you have any thoughts on, on that issue? I do. Um, so, and, and the other half of that question was about the ECB's position, and, and Jay has already mentioned this, and I don't know what it stands for, Pandemic Emergency Purchase Program. Uh, so the ECB now is, is buying into the, uh, from the market the bonds of all of the governments, including Greece, and will continue to do so without any limit. They didn't say, oh, well, we only have a certain percentage. They will do this without limit. And what does this do? This does ensure that the governments of Italy and Greece can continue their viable uh, fiscal programs without being derailed by a, a, a strike or a, an attack from bond vigilantes. So this is it's a short-term measure in the sense that it will, it will work for this crisis. It doesn't solve the debt sustainability problems long-term of, of Italy or Greece. And it doesn't really obviate the need for a stronger cooperative European measure using the full financial strength of Europe with, with a bond. But it's also very like what you're aiming for in helicopter money. But helicopter money is such an attractive term that people tend to use it for anything that comes into their minds. They say, oh, that involves money and it's, it's, you know, it's progressive and it's uh, liberal, so it must be helicopter money. Now, the idea that, that, that central banks would send out, mail out a check to everybody in, in Europe, the same check, um, it's not going to happen. Now, that doesn't mean it couldn't happen, but it's not going to happen. And why is it not going to happen? Because the politicians will not want it to happen like that. Actually, politicians do like giving out money from time to time to everybody. And the US government has decided to mail a check to everybody, but I think it's only one check for $1,000 or $1,200 or something like that, a gesture of that type. But it's for governments to make those decisions. And because of the European structure with many different countries, it's not going to happen in Europe. 
But what is happening is this kind of a measure which allows and enables the governments to make that kind of spending. It could be very progressive spending. It could be uh, redistributing. Indeed, we see our own government and all of the other governments making large redistributive measures at the moment in the crisis, which involve sending out uh, checks to, to people under different circumstances. It's a political decision. It's a policy decision. It's something that can be facilitated and is being facilitated by the ECB. It's not something that the ECB should make its mind up of. Do you think the people in Slovakia should get the same amount as the people in Luxembourg? Or not? Or how about citizens, non-citizens, permanent residents, people? No. This is not a matter for, for a central bank. It would be uh, absorbing powers that, that politicians need to use and should use wisely. Good. Thank you. And finally, John, any thoughts on um, uh, exiting, um, particularly that notion David Chance raises of the younger going back to work sooner? Yeah, look, I think Patrick kind of raised this issue. I mean, it's very much this one I can pass to the politicians just as, uh, as well as Patrick did earlier um, on, the, on the helicopter money. I mean, I think it would be incredibly difficult to imagine this unwind taking place generationally or even in different places. I think we know that a lot of the young people that got hit, got hit in certain sectors, particularly hospitality and retail and those, a lot of those will be expected to rebound quickly um, when, we, when we kind of get back at, at, at this. But I think it's really important that in the short term that those people are actually protected. And that's why I think the idea that we applied you know, payments that were related to salaries and things like that for people that generally are lower income earners anyway was an incredibly smart move in terms of, of moving it forward. In the short term, as we all know, there's plenty of work to be done, um, helping communities to, to we've kind of set up, you know, lots of frameworks and things. And I think in the month or two that, that's coming down, I think it would be a lot more, you know, useful for people that are in that category and you know, you're retired and you're rolling up that season and helping locally. But I think one of the things I pointed out recently is remember, this is not everybody out of work. I mean, there are an awful lot of people earning an awful lot of money that they would have been doing before whether it's as pensions or as in the public sector and others. And so the real problem we have here is not just this group getting them back to work, it's actually going to be connecting up all that money to businesses and others that can actually provide services as quickly as we can once we can reopen the, the social distance. Good, well, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank uh, all of our members, everyone who tuned in today, my colleagues behind the scenes have done enormous work, and most of all, the speakers who took time to, to join us today. Uh, I'd like to flag to you that in about 47 hours, we'll have our next event. Tom Wright from the Brookings Institution will talk about um, the situation in the United States, the effect of all of this on the politics of the United States and the role of the United States in the, in the global system. And finally, I'd like to offer best wishes to, to everyone, uh, to all, of, anyway, all our members and their families and friends coming through this very difficult period. Uh, very best wishes from all of us at the Institute. Uh, very good afternoon to you. Thank you.